Welcome to Bethlehem Church Online. I'm Pastor Matt. I'm so excited that you decided to join us for worship today. I hope the singing and preaching of God's Word is uplifting and it gives you just what you need. I'm not sure where you are in your relationship or your walk with the Lord, uh, but I want today to be a blessing. I want you to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so we pray that today is encouraging and that it's just what you need. If it's your first time, make sure to click the link in the post and fill out that form. We have a free gift for you following today's service. Thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the service. The title of the message is Sharing is Caring. Sharing is Caring. How many of you are just an oversharer? You, okay, yeah. And everybody's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, you went a little too far like five minutes ago. Amen. That's okay. Sharing is caring. I'm excited about the last message here of Hebrews. What a good passage. What a great book. How many have enjoyed Hebrews going through it? Yeah. Amen. It, it has been such a blessing to me. Um, just revisiting these texts and getting just a new, fresh perspective on it. Uh, it's been really, really good. The benediction, just verse 20 to 25, is something that I think we all would benefit from. Just reading every morning and just sitting in it. How many have had like a passage of scripture that like sticks with you? Anybody? Where it's like, man, that is just so good. And you read it and it always ministers to you. That I, I foresee that becoming one for, for me, for sure. But let's go from verse number 10. We'll read from verse 10 on and then we'll pick it apart. And then we'll take communion. And I have one more thing at the end of that. And then we'll go to the house. How many have got big Super Bowl plans? Anybody? Yeah? We're coming. We'll see you there. Amen. <laughs> You're the only one. How, how many are making ribs today? I, I did last night. No, my wife did, actually. I can't take credit for that. I pulled them out of the oven. That was it. We're on this, like, carnivore kick, so we're all, always cooking. But, yeah. Um, let's see. Who's cooking nachos? Who's doing nachos? Anybody? Yeah, we're showing it. Y'all pray for Sean. He's starting a, a new venture, new career. Amen. Uh, let's see. What else could we have? How many are, like, just going to get a rotisserie chicken from the grocery store, and that's it? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> no? Anybody ordering pizza? Okay, Christine. But you're not eating that, are you? Because you'll eat cereal. You'll order pizza and eat cereal. No, <laughs> chips. <laughs> oh, it's funny. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to think. Who's having crabs? Anybody having crabs? Not me. I was just wondering. I'm just thinking of all the food I want to eat right now. Steamed shrimp. Have I made anybody hungry? Okay, cool. All right. Job well done. Anthony, good to see you. Little Anthony, not so little. Good to see you too. <laughs> Amen. Come on in. Verse number 10, let's read together. We have an altar from which those who worship at the tabernacle do not have a right to eat. Now, this is, you know, we've seen a lot of Old Testament scriptures, Old Testament passages that are infused here. Hebrews, you know, the, the language that the, the Jews uh, speak, you know, we're talking about the bridge between uh, the old covenant and the new covenant, um, how they would operate versus how it intersects with how we operate. Um, and so we really have to dig in and figure out what, can I have a sip? Appreciate it. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, dig in with, that's an energy drink, isn't it? I know, always energy drink with Anthony. Um, this is my energy drink right here. Amen. It's decaf. Just kidding. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we got to piece this together from the Old Testament. So we have an altar from which those who worship at the tabernacle do not have a right to eat. So I just kind of investigated that this week, and it was very, very interesting. Verse number 11. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned where? Outside the camp. Verse 12. Therefore, Jesus also suffered where? Outside the gate. 
so that he might sanctify or set apart the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him where? Bearing his disgrace. For we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one to come. Somebody say amen. Amen. Therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Don't neglect to do what is good and to share, for God is pleased with such sacrifices. Obey your leaders and submit to them, since they keep watch over your souls, as those who will give an account, so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are convinced that we have a clear conscience, waiting, uh, wanting rather, to conduct ourselves honorably in everything. And I urge you all the more to pray that I may be restored to you very soon. So whoever the author is of this book, he was separated from them. Here's the benediction, love this. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight, through who? Through who? Is it not up on the screen? Okay, y'all scared to say his name. Through... Okay, there we go. You could say the same thing. I don't know, same name, right, 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 Jesus Christ. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to receive this message of exhortation. For I have written to you briefly. Be aware that our brother Timothy has been released. If he comes soon enough, he will be with me when I see you. Greet all your leaders and all the saints. Those who are from Italy send you, uh, those who are from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with you all. Uh, what a great book. What a phenomenal book. A lot of people view this as a sermon based on, you know, the fact that he says, receive this message of exhortation that I've written to you briefly. Uh, and I would say that it definitely has a sermon vibe, a sermon feel to it. The letter does. Um, but so many good things here. So let's jump, let's jump in. Uh, in the Old Testament, the high priest was not permitted to eat of the sin offering. So if we go to verse number 10, We have an altar from which those who worship at the tabernacle do not have a right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the most holy place by the high priest as a sin offering are burned outside of the camp. So the high priest, if the offering was in fact a sin offering, that that was a sacrifice that was meant to be taken outside the camp and burned. It was a sacrifice, watch this, for the people. It was was to cover the sins of the people. It is this connection that the author of Hebrews makes with Jesus. Jesus offered himself as a sin offering for the people. And for this reason, he was taken outside the city and offered there as a criminal to those standing by and watching. But he was a sin offering for the world to the Father. This distinction is incredible. I, I, I thought about this when I first read it, and I'm like, why does it say we have an altar? You could substitute that word altar for cross, essentially, the place where he was sacrificed. Sacrifice. We have an altar from which those who worship at the tabernacle do not have a right to eat. At first, I'm like, that's kind of strange. What's that all about? They don't have a right to eat. What sacrifices were ineligible for the high priest to eat because at some point they would make a sacrifice and then that animal that was burned up would be consumed. The distinction going to the Old Testament, looking it up, is when that animal was offered by the high priest for the people. Not for himself in that sense, but for the collective whole as a sin offering for all of the people. Remember, it was probably a month or so ago, a few chapters back where we talked about Uh, the sins that were committed, essentially, uh, that they didn't know. If a sin was committed, um, you know, that that basically they were unaware of and they were made aware, everyone had to partake in this offering, in this cleansing. Uh, Sin affects everyone. This idea of sin offerings, it, it permeated all of the people. And so in this specific instance, when a high priest was to make a sin offering, he did not consume it, but he took it outside of the camp and burned it there. 
not to be consumed. And that's a good picture of what we should do with sin. Offer it to the Lord and take it way outside the camp and let it be burned. Why? Because that's what we ought to do with sin. How many of us see the results of sin on our lives, on our society? Not just our own sin, and I mean, I'm thinking about like the disciples when they were with Jesus and Jesus was going to heal, you know, one of the, uh, the lame or uh, the woman with the issue of blood or whatever the miracle was that was to take place. What, what did they assume? The disciples assumed that they were in that position because of their what? Because of their sin. But as we consider the whole, it's not necessarily about just their sin. In some of those, it was the case. But it's about the fact that there is a collective nature Oh my, that slide made it back in. Uh, there is a, a, a collective, na- was that there this morning? Are we on the right slide deck? Do you have this, do you have the title slide, Bill? I'm squirreling out, guys. Bear with me. I took that one out. Okay, all right, I'm just making sure. I must have missed one. Um, but anyway, we see the collective nature of what sin does in our world. Turn on the TV. Right? Look at our families. Look at our children. They're being attacked. It's, it's wreaking havoc, so to speak. Sin is there. It needs to be dealt with. And so it's, it's not just your individual sin, but it's the collective nature of it. And in this specific instance, when, how, how do we discern? Well, we discern because the author of Hebrews is telling us specifically, this offering, what Jesus has done on the cross, is not an offering. It is not a sacrifice. He, Jesus, was the sacrifice, correct? And it says that. But, but it is not a sacrifice that is to be consumed by the high priest, which separates it. It makes it a sin offering. It makes it an offering that was for the collective whole of the people. And what the author of Hebrews is saying is, do you understand what Jesus has done? Where where does this categorically fit into the old covenant? Where does the new covenant, where the old covenant ends and the new covenant begins, where is it? It's with Jesus. And what he has done, the sacrifice that he has done, the category that it is in is a sin offering, which means it is not to be consumed. It is something to be taken outside of the camp. And what that means is what he has done is for everyone. It was not just the high priest, it was for the collective whole of the nation. And so the author of Hebrews, the implication here is that if you understand that this has moved from God's firstborn, the children of Israel, then to every nation, every tribe, uh, Pentecost uh, hears everyone, the Holy Spirit, they hear the preaching in their own language and they take it back. Jesus has witnessed to the Samaritan woman and she has taken the gospel back and people now are hearing the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done. It is traveling. It is going out. And where is it going? It's going to the ends of the world. Why? Because this is a sacrifice not to be consumed. This is a sacrifice for everyone's sin. Make no mistake. That's what the author is saying. That's incredible. Now, verse 13, look at verse 13. Let us then... Go, let us then go to him where? Outside the camp. Look at verse 13. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace. Verse 13 carries a significant weight with a call for us to go outside of the camp and bear his disgrace. For me, the gesture of bearing his disgrace and then symbolically going outside of the city is a strong call to taking ownership in the evangelistic work of the cross. When we pursue movement towards Jesus, we are inevitably identifying with him and therefore showing our proverbial cards. Now, how does this specifically relate to Jesus and how did this play out during the life of Jesus? And we're going to get into this here in, in just a short time when we, when we have Easter. And, you know, Palm Sunday and Good Friday. I'm looking forward to that Good Friday service. That was awesome last year where we have worship and communion together. 
Uh, and then, of course, Easter Sunday, looking to the resurrection. But this passage is specifically letting us know that how it, it worked out for him to be outside of the camp wasn't by chance. It was on purpose. And then when we read the story, we find out, how did that play out? Well, criminals, specifically, weren't given the dignity of that sort of execution in city limits. They were taken outside the camp. And so at, at that point, it is, they are tried, and we talked about this last week, right? The Sanhedrin, uh, even, even Pilate, he said, look, I don't find any what? Fault. The other two thieves that were with him, they were thieves. They were guilty. They were to be taken outside of the camp. But Jesus, this other man that was with them, there was nothing that could be found that would stick to him. But yet he was still marched outside of the city like a sin offering, understanding that there is so much more happening here. He knew, the disciples knew, you're, you're, not, you're not telling the truth. This trial is a botched trial. He is the Son of God. I've seen him heal. I've seen him touch people. I've seen him work. I know that Jesus is who he said he is. But look, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. But in that context specifically, it was a disgraceful context. Why? Because criminals are led outside of the city. And so him knowing in the Old Testament, if that sacrifice was for a sin offering for all of the people, it was to be taken outside of the camp and burned. He, knowing what he was doing, by his stripes we are healed. The heavenly Father received, understood what his son was doing and received the sacrifice outside of the camp. It was accepted by the Father for the entire world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We have to understand and internalize that he bore the disgrace as a criminal for you and for me so that he could be led outside of the camp. But here's the thing. We know that he wasn't a criminal. We know that he was telling the truth. Guess who doesn't know that? People who aren't delivered, people who aren't saved, people who haven't put their faith and trust in who Jesus is. And so the author of Hebrews says, look, if there is ever anyone that should have the confidence to go and identify with him outside of the city, it is the believers. But in your mind, you go, no, that means I'm a criminal. That means I'm walking outside of the city, and, and if I'm there, everyone else views that as disrespect. Everyone else views that as, as me being someone who I'm not. Absolutely. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we all ought to take that walk outside the city. And we all ought to say, the disgrace that he bore was actually my disgrace. I was the criminal, not him. I was the perpetrator. I was the one who should have stood trial. He didn't open his mouth. He walked like a sheep to the slaughter outside of the camp, lifted up as a criminal, naked, ashamed, beaten, and killed as a sacrifice, a sin offering sacrifice. They thought it was because he was a criminal, but it was because that was the law. The sin offerings had to be taken outside of the camp. And so the, the vision symbolically here is that they led him as a criminal outside the city. And the author of Hebrews says, look, you ought to take that walk. You ought to follow him out. You ought to step into that disgrace with him. Why? Because it's actually not disgraceful at all. It's actually the most incredible thing that any human being has ever done for any other human being on the planet. It's the good news. It's the gospel. Do you know that's the amazing thing? The good news, the gospel, it, it isn't a set of principles. It's not like, and I, felt, I was listening to this podcast this week. I think it was called Forbidden Knowledge or something like that. But it's like all this alien stuff with the government. Anybody else into that? No one? A couple? Man, I'm squirreling out. Mike's like, okay, here we go. <laughs> He's like, should have left it classified for us smart people. <laughs> I'm the peasantry way down the line going, release it. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> the, 
But yeah, it's like, we're thinking that there's like some kind of forbidden knowledge out there. You know, how many conspiracy theorists do we have in here? You know, anybody? I just want to know where my people are at. Just kidding. You all are all alone. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm coming outside the city with you. <laughs> Let's take a walk. It's going to be great. But yeah, we, th- we think that it's like some kind of forbidden knowledge. We think that, you know, the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, they know something that we don't know. The truth is, is that those that are delivered, those that have put their faith and trust in Jesus, we know something that they don't know. It's actually not about money and power. It's actually from the beginning, beginning been about the enemy leveraging for money and power. He has offered with, I mean, think about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I'm just riffing here. This is, I'm way out away from my outline. And at some point, I'll make my way back. But think about it. It's always tempted us to think about how we can leverage and make the most out of our three score and ten here on this earth. But what the author of Hebrews is saying, we should take a walk outside of the camp and bear the disgrace because we understand that it's not about this city. It's not about this life. It's what? The one to come. And if the enemy can keep you focused on this one and the rat race that is this life, he wins. You lose. We're like, I don't want to take a walk outside. I don't want to be identified as a criminal. That's what it was then. You know what it is now? It's identifying as a Christian. I, I, you know, I believe what I believe, and if they believe what they believe, it is what it is, and everybody's got to find their own way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. What are we doing? Why are we scared? Why haven't we shared? Look, look, if we keep moving on this line, it says, let us, verse 13, then go to him outside the camp, bearing his disgrace. For we do not have an enduring city here. Instead, we seek the one to come. Therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that what? Confess his name. Don't neglect to do what is good and to what? Share. For God is pleased with such sacrifices. If we understand that he was the sin offering that no one is to eat of and partake of, partake of, we understand that this is for everyone. This means that this is for the world. And if we are the lucky ones to have figured it out at this point, he needs you sharing about who he is and what he's doing. He's called us to that. Acts 1.8. The believers uh, from before that, that have gone on before us, that have done this very thing, they were willing to walk outside the camp and bear the reproach of his name. It's probably never been easier in our day and age to do this, but yet we still don't do it. There's not really a whole lot of you know, ramifications for us to share Jesus' name today. It's not like we're living in Afghanistan, right? Right? where that would probably come with some issues. But yet we still don't do it. I just think personally that we as a church don't spend enough time meditating on the sacrifice of praise. We don't spend enough time meditating on the fact of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Because if we did, we'd be running outside the camp. We would be living for the kingdom of God. We wouldn't be scared to share who he is to us and what he's done for us. We wouldn't have enough seats in here to fill for people to to sit. They would be filled. Why? Because it would be folks anxious to get into the presence of God and know that what's happening here, and and don't, I mean, we're we're growing. Like, it's happening. But are we doing our part? Have we internalized this aspect that He was the sacrifice. Man, it's crazy. We know that Jesus is the best thing to happen to this world. Somebody say amen. (laughs) Amen. And that is the good news of the gospel. Jesus has accomplished the very thing that we would never have the power to even begin ourselves. Not that the work is done. I'm sorry. Now, typo. I said it this morning too. Now that the work is done, we may share in the fruit of his labor and offer the fruit to everyone that will partake. A few questions for you before we get into the meat of the message. 
how are, how, how are you, how are we rather, how are we doing aligning ourselves with Jesus? He was the sacrifice taken outside the camp, crucified for the world. Where do you stand? The author calls us here, therefore, let us go out to him. How are you doing aligning yourself with Jesus? You know, it, it's, uh, hmm. it's something we need to think about. If, if we are honest and look at our lives, we will know how much we have done this week for the kingdom of God, for the city that is to come, versus how much have we lived for ourselves. Have we even thought about walking outside the camp this week, so to speak? Have we thought about the sacrifice that he made and what that means, the implications for us going to that place? How are we doing? Have you ever been able to share Jesus with a friend, coworker, or neighbor? Have you ever been able to share him with a friend, a coworker, or a neighbor? Well, we should be able to. Do you feel responsible for others hearing and believing in Jesus? Church, do you feel responsible for others hearing and believing in Jesus? Two points today, two main constructs here that I see in the passage as we close out this series. Number one, look at verse number, uh, let's see what we find, verse number 15. Therefore, through him, therefore, through him, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of lips that confess his name. Here's the first thing. Through Jesus, we offer up a sacrifice of praise. Through Jesus, we offer up a sacrifice of praise. Like, man. Have we meditated on this? Have we, have we come to grips with the fact that as the high priest were to take that sacrifice, and, and think about it from this perspective, like back in the Old Testament, Sometimes they weren't able to afford a lamb to bring as a sin offering. And it, maybe it, it, was, it was a bird. And that's all the family could offer. But whatever they could do to afford and, and, and to offer up that animal, that is what was representative of their sacrifice for their sin. And remember, it was never final. They had to do it again every year. But have we internalized, have we realized that Jesus was the perfect Lamb of God? Amen. There we go. Ain't nothing like a real good moment in a sermon for a phone to go off. Please silence your phones. Look, think, think about this church. You would have never been able to afford this sacrifice. The pure blood of Jesus. You would have never been able to produce this with your work, with your effort. And understand that God has done this by his stripes. He has done this for everyone. And if we think and, and we ponder and we put our, our minds and our hearts in the right place, we'll understand that Jesus, the one led outside of the camp, was the perfect sacrifice. His blood was everything and more. By the shedding of blood, there is remission for sins. And that sacrifice is offered up, look, for all of us. And if we realize and think and meditate on what he's done, we'll understand that through that is where everything flows. Why is it that we can't uh, find folks to serve? Why is it that we can't find folks to continue to plant churches? I heard this week it was in the millions how many young people are leaving the church. It's crazy. I mean, there's millions going, but quite a few leaving. What's happening? 
Somewhere along the line, people have stopped talking about the fact that it was Jesus that was led outside of the camp and that it's Jesus who sacrificed everything, who did it all. And maybe we've gotten to the place where we have replaced it with a construct that only lasts for a year. Or we've said, hey, just live a good life and live out these principles, and these principles will change you. Of course, there's sowing and reaping. Of course, if you're nice to people, you'll make friends. But does that change anyone? Does that radically deliver someone who is on their way to a devil's hell because of their sin and turn them from darkness to light? I think not. We need to start thinking about the sacrifice of praise that we can offer through Jesus. It is everything. You, look, we are unable. We are unable to save ourselves. What that family would have endured and sacrificed to make that sacrifice. I think at some point we've become spoiled with the fact that Jesus just gave himself for us. And we take it for granted. Because we didn't have to do anything to earn it. I don't want to take it for granted. I want to live in it and walk in it. I want to go outside the city and join in. Through Jesus, we offer up a sacrifice of praise. Just three things about that idea of what I'm seeing here in the text. Remember that Jesus is the beginning and end of our praise. Remember that Jesus is the beginning and end of our praise. He's it. The final authority, the final matter, He is the one. If you think about something good in this life, it comes from him. Anything in your life that is produced that is good, he's the beginning of it and the end of it. There's nothing about us that is worth saving. Amen? If we get that in our minds and we're like, man, as soon as, let's flip the script on that, as soon as we're like, man, I'm doing so good, take heed lest you fall. He is the beginning and end of all that is said and done. It's not us, it is him. Rhythms of praise for what Jesus has done for us should be consistent and routine. Rhythms of praise for what Jesus has done for us should be consistent and routine. And I don't mean just on Sunday morning. That might be a start. I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad you're joining us online, but maybe next week, try to come in person at 1030. ha <laughs> ha. But, like, let's, let's take this and, and let's go somewhere with it. Like, tomorrow morning, you can wake up and you can think, man, he was let outside of the camp for me. He was, in, he was unjustly treated as a criminal for me. He did it willingly. He, he wasn't jumping and screaming that he was dying unlawfully for something he didn't do. He walked into it. He welcomed it. He knew it was a part of his father's plan, even though it was difficult. Hey, man, he did that for you. You know, he does that for you on Monday morning like he does for you on Sunday morning, too. Consistent and routine. And and here's the thing. For For all the folks that are like, I don't have to come to church to be a Christian or to serve the Lord. I'm coming for you here in a minute. Because that's the next part of the message. But the sacrifice of praise is something we should not neglect. Consistent and routine. How many remember daily what the Lord has done for you? And and we're going to partake in the Lord's table, a consistent, routine memory of us going to that sacrifice of praise. The third thing in this idea that the Lord Jesus is offered up for a sacrifice of praise, Jesus is the name and difference maker in our lives to the God of the universe. Jesus is the name and difference maker in our lives to the God of the universe. When God the Father, when Yahweh looks at you, he sees Jesus. When he sees you, he sees a brother or sister that was rescued by his son. Let's not forget that. We got too much pride in the church house. Way too much pride. Man, God deliver us from our pride. God deliver us from people that fall out of chairs every Sunday. Amen. Back there. Church, our pride is a huge issue. It's a big problem. 
But when we look at the gospel, it has nothing to do with us. I'm like, I'm here because God's called me here. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not here because, like, I worked this thing out and la, 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 la. No. Like, the Lord put me here. He's called me here. It's weighty. There's other things that, uh, yeah, I should probably just be sanding floors and that's it. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, it's not me and I know that. And as soon as we start thinking it is us, we're on the path to being out of it. Humility is always the path to sanctification. It's always the path to being set apart. And, and I, I want you to, to feel this and understand it and live it out, that Jesus is the name and difference maker in our lives to the God of the universe. Have you ever thought about, like, the God of the universe? Yahweh. Like, revealing himself in the ancient Near East and revealing a plan to save humanity and because of his son and because of the Godhead and how they work this thing, we have access to the God of the universe. We're talking about praying and having a relationship where pagans and ignorant people would sacrifice their children just to get God in heaven to turn and look at them. They would kill their own offspring in ignorance. But we have a God who killed his own offspring willingly to redeem us. God is actually not someone who looks down and says, do this or else. He was God that said, I will do this for you because you can, and then you can come to me. I'm not expecting you to do something. I actually will take on the form of a servant. It is not me, God, in heaven that orders all of these things to happen. It is me, God, who will come to you and do what you cannot do because I love you. They had it so wrong. Unbelievable. And we know about it. And we know that God took upon himself the form of a servant. And Hebrews is actually taking it a step further. And he's saying he took upon himself the form of a criminal. Do you see that? For you and for me. This is not, we're not connected with God because of our ability to think highly. We're connected with God because of his ability to come to the lowliest. For Jesus to walk this earth, please silence your cell phones. My ADD is going crazy. Seriously. Je Jesus came and was the lowliest so that you and I can be risen from the lowest place and our feet planted upon a rock to establish our goings. We don't talk about him enough, do we? Hmm. A sacrifice of praise. Jesus is the name and the difference maker in our lives to the God of the universe. It was funny, Sarah was, I tell this story, I probably shouldn't tell the story, but I'm gonna tell it. <laughs> People will re re remain nameless in this story. But my wife was at the gym, and people were talking about uh, Taylor Swift. This was after the horrible loss of uh, the Ravens to Kansas City. I hope Kansas City gets their butts beat today. Yes. Son. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> anyway. She was at the gym, and they were talking about people liking Taylor Swift or not liking. I'm probably butchering the story, but, you know, she just said, I think Taylor Swift is overhyped. Somebody say amen. amen. Not that we're, look, not that we're against Taylor, you know? Like, she's awesome running around in her jet, uh, expanding her carbon footprint while telling all of us tonight. Anyway, uh, it's, it's great. It's great. I love it. Have fun. And it's funny because, like, I think it was two weeks ago, uh, somebody called me. It was a Friday night. I was having family time. And my daughters were running around, dancing all over the house. And isn't that sweet? Yeah. 
Anyway, and the person that I was on the phone with, which is funny, it was actually my therapist. <laughs> she called me, just saying. Uh, and I'm like, hello. And she's like, is that Taylor Swift in the background? <laughs> and I was like, yes, it is. It's family night, and it was River's. Uh, she was up for song selection. And if River ever gets a chance to pick the song that we're dancing around in the house, it's going to be Taylor Swift. So it's not like we're haters, you know what I'm saying? She was on in our house, and I accept that for whatever it is. But anyway, the point of the story was, you know, she's just overhyped. And one of the, the guys in the gym was like, you're, you're one to talk. You believe in the most overhyped person of all time. And his point was, because we're Christians. And I thought to myself, like, I mean, honestly, like, I, I'm terrified for him. Like, I'm terrified for him. Like, I feel that statement to my core, and so does my wife. And we pray for this guy. Like, we're friends with him. It's not like, you know, whatever. Plus, he's a black belt. I can't do nothing about it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like, you want me to say something? Anyway, no, no, okay, okay, good then, good, good. It's a good thing. I'd have been there, shoot. I'd have had to have a gun. That'd be about it. (laughs) But my heart breaks for those folks because they don't understand that he is, he is. He is our connection for the outlet, listen to me, church, internally, made in God's image, we all have an empty place that is only filled with our ability to connect to our creator. And the reason we are able to connect to our creator is because of Jesus. And so therefore, he's not the most overhyped. I think he's the most underutilized. But we as the church, we need to hype him up. We need to understand that the man who came as a lowly criminal, if you will, who was not a criminal, gave us the perfect posture of a servant to promote him. In Acts 1.8, he tells his disciples to be witnesses of himself, right? To go and be a literal, like, take the witness stand and tell everybody who he is. Sharing is caring. Church, he is, he is the sacrifice of praise. What's the second point here that I see? Let's just read together. If you look at verse number 16, don't neglect to do what is good and to share for God is pleased with such such sacrifices. And then it turns and it says this, obey your leaders and submit to them since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief for that would be unprofitable for you. And then it says in verse 18, pray for us twice. Pray for us. We are convinced that we have a clear conscience, wanting to conduct ourselves honorably and everything. And I urge you the more to pray that I might be restored to you very soon. So multiple times after it said, hey, obey, submit to your spiritual leaders in your life and pray for them. Do you see it? So the first thing is through Jesus, we offer up a sacrifice of praise. The second thing, through spiritual leaders, your life's work is established and confirmed. This is a tough one uh, for me in general because I feel as though years of my life was spent following spiritual leaders that were not really spiritual leaders. Spiritual abusers, maybe. Uh, and, And I wrestle with these texts. But if you think about it, why would the enemy not attack from within? Why would the enemy not use pastors, wolves in sheep's clothing, right, to disillusion the flock, to following a spiritual leader, and then takes you right out of the game. But my point is, is why do we do this? We do this because this is what Jesus told us to do. This is the church, the called out assembly, right? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is how God intended it to be. We gather, we get together on the first day of the week and so much the more as we see the day approaching. God calls some pastors, some teachers, some evangelists. God calls us to these positions and then he works what? Through us. Why? To confirm what he's doing in your heart. No man is an island. 
We are not called to operate by ourselves. We are called to operate in the collective, in the gathering, in the church, in the bride of Christ as a son and daughter. None of us are the God. None of us are, uh, you know, if you will, the Messiah. We are brought to the table by the Messiah to be a part of a family. And the collective family of God needs to work together. And in the collective family of God, there are bigger brothers and bigger sisters. Big brothers and big sisters. That would have been the better way to say that. <laughs> Not bigger, but big brothers. And Anyway, you get my point. Oh, goodness gracious. Lord Jesus again. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. I need it. <laughs> but, but what happens? We, we get done wrong. Pastors fail. Men let you down. Women let you down. And then we internalize, and we retract, and we keep our distance. Maybe there's somebody watching online that hasn't been back to church since the last time you were hurt. Look, it's important to be here. It's important to dialogue with, I said spiritual leader for a reason. It's not necessarily a pastor, but I, I think that we can understand the context. And no, here, Romans, Romans 14, 12 says, so then each of us will give an account to himself to God. That's you. But also 1 Peter 4, 5, they will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. Understand this, that I don't take this position lightly. Not only are you going to give an account to God for what you have done with the sacrifice of praise that he has given to you, but I'm going to give an account for every believer that walks through the door of our church. And I'm going to give an account to God for how I, I delivered this text, this sacred book. Was I twisting it for my own gain or was I actually trying to be faithful and just expose the truths that are there so that you can grow in the knowledge of him so that we can make this thing all about who? Jesus. Here, here's what we need. Here's what we need. In point number two, spiritual leaders, your life's work is established and confirmed. Do you know I have to talk to people about what God's doing in my life? I have to have spiritual leaders in my life that I have to go to and say, hey, this is what the Lord's doing in my heart and in my life. What do you think? And then they say, yeah. And they affirm that in me and confirm what God is doing. And sometimes it's like, ah, uh, maybe. What about this? And I'm like, yeah. And you know, sometimes the Lord gives me a word for someone else. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, you need to go tell them this. And you know, many a time, the Lord gives some of you words for me. Sometimes I've ignored them, and I've regretted it every time. But when the Lord speaks to you, and he says, hey, tell this to Pastor Matt. Come and tell me. That type of work, that back and forth, that dialogue, guess what? That is how we're confirmed in what the Lord is doing. Chances are the Lord isn't going to give you a word that isn't confirmed by one to two more. It's true. It's how he works. It's how he worked back then. It's how the Old Testament worked. Confirmed in the mouth of two to three elders, and it's how he still works today. You can't do this thing alone. We're not going to get to the end of this book of Hebrews. And you able to just roguely run around doing whatever you want to do with this amazing truth of what Jesus has done for you. Jesus has done the thing. He, he's done all the work for us to go and do our own thing. No, for us to work together. We need each other. I know maybe, maybe you've been hurt. Maybe a pastor has stepped on you. I didn't say your toes. You need your toes stepped on. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, it's hurt you. We're human. Don't walk away. Call it out. Let's work through it. Because we need each other. In that realm, the sacrifice of praise, it's through Jesus. Our life's work is established through spiritual leadership through working with one another. Why should you submit to a spiritual leader? It's the Lord's way. Hey, this should be a joyful part of your life. That's what the scripture says. It says, uh, it's not profitable for you to walk away from it. This should be with joy. Maybe it's been a while since you've had a good, solid conversation about the Lord's doing what the Lord's doing in your life with somebody else. 
yesterday. Where's Josh at? I see him. Not that Josh, the other Josh. I see him. There's a couple of Joshes. We were just sitting down having a coffee yesterday, just talking about what the Lord's doing in our lives. And maybe he wasn't encouraged, but I was. Because the Lord used him to say, hey, how are you doing? How are you dealing with some of these things that are going on? And I'm like, I'm in a better place now. It was tough a month ago, but we got through it. That affirmation, the Lord's building me up. This should add value to your life. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to add value. I'm here to talk about it, to discuss it with you. And then here's what I need from you. I need your prayer. As we come to the end of this book, the author, whoever he or she is, he's like, hey, I need you to pray for me. Do you believe that my job is weighty, bringing a message from the Lord, exposing the truths of the text for all of us to grow together? If you believe that, I mean, it's weighty. I take it very seriously. I take this book very seriously. And if you believe that, listen, you'll believe this, that your pastor needs prayer. I need you to lift me up as I lift you up. Amen? Amen. Sharing is what? When we consider Jesus, we should see a life lived for others. The most selfless life ever achieved and the perfect example for how we are to live is who? It's Jesus. Amen? This is my, one of my favorite parts about the book as we come to the close. If you look at the benediction at the end, verse 20, now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, what's the next word? Equip. Equip you with everything good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight. Don't miss this. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The author says something extraordinary. What is it? Now, may the God of peace equip you. Not only a hope for the God of the universe to equip you, but that you will do his will because you have everything you need in Jesus. And in turn, Jesus will be glorified as a result. Somebody say amen. If you understand, this is it. This is what gets me out of bed. This is what gets me going, Holy Ghost. Come on, amen. This is it. If you understand that how you receive what Jesus has done for you and how you turn it into action is literally what gives Jesus Christ glory to a dying world for them to see him. Look, you'll take it seriously. Do you, it's not about you and it's not about me. It's always been about him. Did you hear what I said? The scripture says, God will equip you to do his will and bring glory to Jesus. Maybe this morning you're like, I don't know about moving into this public place of sharing my faith. I don't know about going outside of the city. For him, he was looked at as a criminal. I don't know if I can take that. Yes, you can. He's equipped you. Church, if you understand that he has an assignment for you, he has someone for you to lift up. He has someone for you to encourage. But it ain't about you. It's about Jesus. And it's about giving the glory to Jesus. We've got enough churches that are man-centric. We've got enough places on the planet that point to a human that says, look how good I am. This ain't the place. This is the place where we point to the Son of God. And we say everything we do is because of him. And everything that we do, we hope, brings him glory. This ain't about me. It's about him. Live for the glory of Jesus alone. I pray we will receive this challenge. There is no room for us to receive the glory, but there is a beautiful gospel opportunity for all of us to be equipped to live like Jesus for the glory of Jesus. May the God of peace work this eternal work in all of our hearts this morning. Grace and peace be to each and every one of you and all God's children said. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Thank you for watching and joining us for our church online. I pray this experience was just what you needed today. 
If you made a decision for the Lord to follow Christ, or if the Lord did something in your heart that was special today, we would love to hear about it. Post it in the comments, send us a message, and we'll reach out to you. Have a wonderful week, and God bless.